Our panelists today have traveled from Geneva, New York to be with us. We're very honored to have such illustrious panelists with us today. The, um, the, uh, the chair of our session, Simon Collard Wexler, a, tw a, 2009, a 2009 scholar, will be moderating the panel. I'll let him introduce our panelists to you today. We have 90 minutes for the panel, including questions and answers. So thank you, everybody. OK. Thank you so much for the introductions. And thanks to everyone coming here in such great numbers for what will undoubtedly be a very interesting discussion. We're thrilled to have two prominent scholars and practitioners of law and international affairs here today to discuss uh, the theme of Canada and the world. Uh, Sujit Chowdhury is a 2010 Trudeau Fellow, a professor of law at NYU, and an internationally recognized authority on comparative constitutional law and comparative constitutional development. He was previously associate dean at University of Toronto Law School, holds law degrees from Oxford, Toronto, Harvard, was a Rhodes Scholar, clerked at the Supreme Court of Canada. You can find all the details in a, <laughs> it's a very humbling experience to read his details online. Uh, Louis Arbour is a 2003 Trudeau mentor and the president and CEO of the International Crisis Group and former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, chief prosecutor for the International Criminal, uh, Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, and was also, as a side gig, uh, judge on the Supreme Court of Canada. So you can uh, read more about their incredibly illustrious careers uh, in the program and online. Uh, avant d'aller plus loin, je vais juste expliquer un peu le, le format du panel. Uh, on va vraiment débuter en discutant uh, sur quelques questions, uh, juste deux questions pour débuter. Puis ensuite, on va prendre des questions de, 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 des participants ici dans la, dans, la, dans la salle. Et puis ensuite, on va répondre encore à deux autres questions, puis prendre d'autres questions encore une fois. Et, uh, I'll maybe just start with a very easy question for, uh, for either Sujit or, or Louise. A very easy question about um, the Arab Spring, uh, specifically democratization and the, and the paths of democratization in, uh, in the Arab Spring. So what has the Arab Spring taught us about the way that societies evolve and change and the way that democracies uh, take root? Maybe Louise, you can start. Uh, yes. Let me start with... Uh a quote, if I can, if, if I've memorized it correctly, from the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I think says something like, maybe Sujit will have it memorized better, it says something like, uh, <clears throat> it is imperative if man is not to be driven uh, to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights be protected under the rule of law. There's the Arab Spring, which, by the way, I don't think is referred to uh, as a season anymore, uh, unless you have a very different sense of how long a spring lasts. And so, so I think uh, it's more commonly now, I think, referred to as the Arab uprisings, uh, which are, I think, still taking place. But in a sense, it's very much that. Huh? It's, it, it's, it, it's been a challenge to authoritarianism and very much this notion that uh, I, I was never too clear in the Universal Declaration whether there was a moral judgment contained in that. It is imperative or it is essential uh, that uh, if man is not to be driven to have recourse to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, wasn't too sure if um, there's a subliminal message that man should, um, facing tyranny and oppression, have recourse to rebellion. In any event, it's going to be a very long season. Huh? It's going to be a season that's going to last decades. Uh, I think before there's a reconfiguration. Uh, it could even include a reconfiguration of borders um, in that region. What does it teach us about democracy? Uh, it's not just what's happening in the Middle East, I think, that is teaching us. Uh, I, I, in my own work now with International Crisis Group, where we work primarily on the issue of the prevention of armed conflict, I think we have embraced an extremely um, impoverished uh, vision of democracy, reduced to electoral mechanisms, some more credible than others. In fact, I participated until last year uh, in a, it was called a Global Commission on uh, Elections, Democracy, and Security that was chaired by Kofi Annan which shifted the language from free and fair elections, which I think is a pretty tired expression, to elections with integrity, 
which brings into play the whole question, for instance, of financing of elections. And so I think what's, what's the challenge against authoritarianism that we've seen in North Africa and, and in the Middle East, I think has parallels also in, um, not a parallel, but there, there's, I think there are concerns about the, uh, the poverty of, of democratic um, institutions in other parts of the world that may not have these the characteristics of authoritarianism that we saw uh, in the Middle East. The Syrian crisis now is probably the most challenging um, in terms of trying to see a path through the, the resolution of, the, of the, the crisis and what its consequences will be. But I'll let maybe Sujit take sure. it. So, um, you know, just maybe to pick up on Louisa's last comment about Syria, you know, I think we're kind of at this moment of um, intractability, uh, or it's, I mean, it's, there's a certain degree of hopelessness at this point, uh, because it's really not quite clear how we might put the pieces together, back together. You know, with four million plus IDPs, uh, seven million people uh, surviving on the basis of international humanitarian assistance, uh, two million refugees, um, three clusters of kind of armed groups within Syria, all sorts of international involvement. I mean, how the pieces come back together is not at all clear. We might come back to this when we talk about R2P a bit, you know, what, what, what Syria means for R2P in the future. So, you know, with respect to the Arab Spring, I guess I would just say a couple of things. The first is that, you know, even though Louise is absolutely right that the triggers for the uprisings were quite similar, right? It was kind of a failure to respect basic human rights, but also corruption and kind of, um, and clientelism, and, and the sense of not building inclusive societies where people who played by the rules uh, could move forward and succeed, right? That is kind of where patronage and clientelistic relationships are essential to how one ma makes one wa makes one ways in life. That, at some point, that gives rise to a certain degree of frustration. And so there is an empirical aspect to this, which is that if you build a society like that, it will explode at some point, or very well could, and that's what happened. But all these countries are very different and the ways in which um, regime change has come about is, are very different. So, you know, Libya, you basically had an uprising degenerating into a civil war uh, in the context of a country where there was not much of a state to begin with. And now we have a security situation that has kind of overwhelmed the constitutional process uh, because there is no state per se, or it's severely damaged. Tunisia and Egypt are very different, right? Uh, because the state structures survived to a greater ex uh, lesser extent intact. Um, and we didn't have civil war type situations, and so you have more of a, if Libya is kind of, we can call it a post-conflict or post-civil war uh, type transition, where now you have to kind of, in a sense, bring armed militias into the political process. You know, Tunisia and, and Egypt is more of a post-authoritarian moment, right, where you, you basically have um, majorities who are democratically disempowered um, seeking to mobilize in politics. And so the, the, the ways in which one thinks about what to do in these contexts uh, is very different. Yemen's a different case altogether, too. I mean, more kind of post-civil war. But, and again, in a country with, lot lower, with met, much lower, lower levels of literacy, uh, human capital, um, much less urbanized. And so how one does politics in that context is very different. I mean, just two quick things I would say would be that, we, A, we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, this is going to be a generational type of project. Every country will take its own course. B, um, it's very hard to provide generic kind of advice uh, as to how a country should proceed because you have to be so contextual in these situations. But I would say that there are some mistakes that we're seeing um, in the way in which these transitional processes have been, have been, have proceeded. So, mis you know, mistake number one is that, uh, you know, constitutions will only, s constitutions should be, are basically at the, you know, are alternatives to civil war. P we create constitutions basically so people do politics so they don't fight. That's what constitutions are meant to do. And the way to get people to play by a constitution under its rules is to include them in the process, to make sure that you have an inclusive constitution building process, that you set up the constitutional rules so that, so that people can form political parties and can channel their political energy into parties and, and elections. And, and, you, and you don't make many, you don't exclude many people. I mean, we see mistakes all, this happening already in Egypt. You know, you have basically cycling constitutional processes. This, the military, then the brotherhood, then the military, and, and, and no one feels, no one who's excluded feels any stake in the other side's constitution. The constitution's become 
a partisan document. Not, it doesn't transcend partisanship. So I think Egypt's in a very bad place right now. Um, in, in Libya, uh, in addition to the security situation, you have this unbelievably broad political isolation law that I know ICG and others have written about, which basically would exclude from participating in public office and in holding any bureaucratic position people who held any type of position under Gaddafi. And, to kind of, and that's you know, debotification all over again. And in a context where you have no security, uh, what will people do? They'll take up arms. They'll, they'll join militia. So there are these type of mistakes that are happening. And number two, you have to remember that constitutions in these contexts are, are double packs. They're packs among the people, but also packs among the powerful. And they're social contracts, but they're also elite bargains. And you have to design your process to make sure you get both types of agreement at the same time. And, 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 and sometimes it's, you know, what you see in these processes that there's emphasis of one over the other, as opposed to thinking about how to do both in parallel and to articulate those processes. Number three, we have to be, we have to remember that in creating new democracies, we can also set the stage for a new type of authoritarianism, where you have an elected government that takes over the state under a new constitution, and then begins to backslide by undermining democracy from within. What's happening in Hungary, for example, uh, is very much a cautionary tale for the Middle East. And people are thinking about this, but it's, it's an issue that I think needs to be on the agenda a bit more. Let me just, just a, a footnote, you know, when we ask what are we learning from this, yeah. uh, Sujit already mentioned everything's very contextual, uh, the lessons learned, so you have to be very careful. One of the puzzling uh, issues on the, the the scale of Arab uprisings is how come nothing happened to the Gulf monarchies? Yeah. You know, you, you might have thought that if you were, if it was really a wave of challenge of authoritarianism, it looked to me like pretty good candidates yeah. for to be challenged, and yet so far, not much. And you know, why Yemen and, and Bahrain didn't quite right. get right. off the ground, and um, and uh, and now. Syria, which was described, I think, at the outset as a, uh, you know, a country that uh, created the danger of a spillover in the region and is now perceived, actually, as a regional war with an epicenter in Syria. The spillover is long, uh, and w why, why there? And, and uh, So I think it's very difficult to, to extrapolate and learn a great deal. There's an exception to everything, I think, in this extremely chaotic, uh, uh, challenging, difficult environment. And Suja, I just want to pick up on something you were saying about kind of constitutional design and how these, and how the, each country is very unique and yeah. perhaps the demographic makeup, the type of the conflict. I mean, we look at, you know, Libya, as you said, has a civil war, but geographically separated parties. Syria right. is much more complex. Egypt right. was something else altogether. Yeah. Um, and you talk about elite packs, and people are talking about a political you know, compromise in Syria. There's only a political solution, yeah. and the political solution presumably will be embodied in a constitution. Right. Some people have made the argument, well, we need something that represents the balance of power. You say something that needs to represent people's interests of the, the main stakeholders. Yeah. How would you operationalize that, for example, in Syria, and the process to get there, even if we know what the outcome is? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, I have no idea what the outcome should be, you know? I mean, I mean, there's a couple of, you know, people who do this for, for a living, and, you know, John McGarry's here, and there's others in the room who, you know, involved in this business, you know, will tell you that, you know, parliamentary power sharing systems um, with kind of proportional representation to elect, to, to um, legislatures and then rules that ensure that cabinets are politically inclusive, um, but which nonetheless allow for the evolution of political preferences over time. So if you have, you know, ethnicity-based political parties that morph into more interest-based political parties, that's one type of technique. And, and you know, and until the Arab Spring, most people would have said that's in the post kind of conflict context. If you want to build an inclusive democracy, that's the, the best type of mechanism. Whereas presidentialism is not a good idea. What's very interesting, post Arab Spring, is that's not been what people want. So you know, what you see in the region is there is a tradition of having strong presidents, and there is an equation of parliamentary democracy with chaos. And so people don't want to go there, you know, and, and, and although it was discussed early on, let's say in Tunisia and Egypt, not an option anymore um, on either side, right? A and so what people are looking to is semi-presidentialism, the French, the French model, where you have a, a parliament that kind of, in a sense, selects a prime minister that, that has the confidence of the parliament and a directly elected president, and they, they have to share power in some way and the president's meant to represent the nation as a whole. And that seems to be a model that improbably, 
that has kind of gained currency in, as, a, as a power sharing type device and in some sense growing out of Africa. I mean, if you think about Kenya, for example, or CAR or elsewhere, semi-presidentialism has been pressed into this service. And now in the post-Arab Spring context in Tunisia and Egypt, you know, seculars and uh, secular liberals on the one hand and Islamists on the other hand looked at semi-presidentialism as a, as a device for, 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 for parties of different ideological orientations to actually share power. Um, first of all, I think there's a danger of putting too much emphasis on the, the perfect sort of democratic yeah. electoral model. I mean, there are some that are not easy to export and work perfectly well with a non-written constitution in the UK, for, for instance. Uh, and, and it seems to me that what you have to focus on is having institutional safeguards of one kind or another for the protection of minority interests. Mm. Uh, you can have it, for instance, in, uh, under the Canadian model with a combination of federalism mm. and uh, judicial uh, empowerment mm. for, with, with a, the specific mandate of the protection of minority rights. It could be accommodated in electoral formulas, but I think it's a mistake to think that there is a, a perfect electoral mm -hmm. model that's mm -hmm. going to work in Afghanistan and in mm -hmm. the Central African Republic. Mm -hmm. I deplore um, the lack of interest and investment in the kind of development envelope, for instance, in the United Nations towards judicial mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. um, we spend enormous amounts of money on the electoral processes uh, and very, very little on the other branches of governance that, that I think are critical uh, to maintain. That's the first. Th my second comment is, you know, I work now in, as I said, the prevention, mitigation, and resolution of armed conflict. And it seems to me that the rush to, um, to, to the design of a constitution mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> overlooks the fact that these are, as we've repeated, I think, in our own history, these are living documents. And we, you have, in some cases, Bosnia is a very good example, the Dayton Peace Accord. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not faulting anybody. I don't think any other model would have worked mm -hmm. to bring uh, peace to Bosnia. But essentially, it created a constitutional model that mirrored the pathology mm -hmm. of that country mm -hmm. It's it, um, with an ethnic uh, balance uh, that I think in the long term is not viable for, for Bosnia. It's 20 years later now. The question is, now that you're locked in mm -hmm. to that model with vetoes and, and so on, an extremely complex model, mm -hmm. how can mm -hmm. one now redesign a kind of post-Dayton uh, constitution for Bosnia? is very challenging. But the reality is there's not the moment, as uh, it seems the Muslim Brotherhood thought they would be in Egypt in mm -hmm. designing the constitution mm -hmm. with the kind of permanence that, or permanency, whatever the word is, uh, that we attach to these kinds of documents. I think we have to think in conflict areas of kind of sortie de crise constitutional arrangements and then a maturity, I think, that can come later. Uh, I, can I just add something to that? Which is, you know, I, I think this issue about, I, I couldn't agree more about the issues about timing and sequencing. So there, there is this, it's very interesting, you know, you go to Tunis, you go to uh, Egypt, and people say, where's the Constitution? We want it. It should have been done already. Because there's this rush to get it all done. Let's have a constituent assembly election. Let's give it a very tight, unrealistic timeline. Let's get it over with. Because there's all these deferred issues of economic and social investment that are the serious issues that need addressing. But if you look historically at successful constitution building processes, even the, the, the first phase would have taken three years. You know, so. India would be one example. Um, South Africa would be another example. It takes time. And you have to think in, in, in an iterative, iterative way, you know, of kind of inclusive governments with governed by broad principles and an interim document and people get used to working with each other and engaging in politics together. And then over time, you move to a more comprehensive constitutional settlement. And, and a big, and a, so I agree entirely with Louise. And I think. There's been a, and that, you know, that type of model is what we saw in South Africa. It's also what we saw in Eastern and Central Europe and many of the post-89 transitions. And it's not been one that's taken on board thoroughly in, in, the, in, the, in the Arab region, and that's a mistake. Just to, to bridge off of something else um, Louis said about the UN. You know, I, yeah, the UN is a fabulous place to give election advice on the design of an electoral system and to run your election. They don't know much else about what happens afterward. 
um, when it comes to designing structures of government. And so they don't have a lot of expertise on how to design an executive how to design a legislature, how, what their relationship should be, how to design a judicial branch. And in part, that's because those issues divide member states. So it's very hard to develop an in-house view, at least that's my sense, on these questions of structure, particularly federalism, right? I mean, if you think about the knots in which the organization got in over the reference to the ICJ over Kosovo, that was in part driven by s states with sub-state nationalisms not wanting to legitimize the, the debate, it, you know, cost of secession and concerned about, and even concerned about making, of the, about sub-state nationalism giving rise to claims for federalism. So the, it's hard for the organization to get traction on these types of issues, and at least in my sense. Um, and just to switch gears for a second, um, when we talk about what the international community can do, we're talking about the UN here. I'd like to maybe touch on what Canada could or should or didn't or might do in the future on this, but also uh, bring it to the broader question of RTP. Um, and I know that RTP is not just military intervention. There's, a, there's different actions that can, that can take um, part in this. But you know, what basically have the events in, in Libya and in Syria, but also in the DRC and Sudan, have, what have they told us about how we can truly protect populations, um, not just at the rhetorical level, but in practice? <laughs> That's a good place to start. Right. Well, I think there's a lot that could be said. First, I think it's useful to remember the, the genesis, the origin of that uh, doctrine, which I think has now taken shape in the UN. Is, and it's a, it's a good time to start looking at whether the deliverables are, are, are gonna be forthcoming. So it started after the, uh, the, military, the NATO military intervention in Kosovo, and as you recall, Canada stepped up to the plate when Kofi Annan pose the question is, you know, are we now going to see a world where they are allegedly legitimate uh, military interventions without Security Council approval? It was a pretty challenging question, and um, I think it's still, uh, you know, with the recent discussions of the potential U.S. Uh, airstrikes in Syria, where it's very clear they would not have been Security Council approval, how many of those are you going to see before the Security Council can be essentially bypassed if it continues, I think, to be uh, hijacked by some of the veto holders. So I think that's the origin of the responsibility to protect. Uh, the document that emerged from the Canadian-led uh, commission, I think, was a very useful document. There was something very smart, I think, in moving away from uh, the, the French-based concept of le droit d'ingérence, the right to intervene, um, and transforming that into a responsibility was a very clever um, uh, way, I think much more attractive uh, way of package, packaging it. I'm not sure that it has displaced, though, the skepticism of many of the intended recipients of this humanitarian gesture as to the purity of intention uh, of those proposed interveners. Certainly in developing countries, there's an enormous amount still of skepticism about the, as I said, the purity of intentions. Um, and as you know, eventually the doctrine was embraced by the United Nations General Assembly in 2005, and it's now captured, I think, in that's the doctrine that we now talk about, which focuses on primarily on the responsibility of states to protect their own, uh, well, and I have to be very careful on the use of language here, to, I always say to protect the people under their jurisdiction from genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. And I say that because I think there's been a lot of slippage in the language. You hear people talk about the responsibility of states to protect their own people. Well, some states take the view that uh, some amongst their midst are not our own people. I think it's very dangerous. We uh, should be very careful in not using that kind of language. It's the people to whom the state owes a responsibility um, uh, the rights holders in the country. So the emphasis, I think, at the origin of the doctrine was very much placed on state responsibility. And then there's the second part, which is if a state proves unwilling or unable to discharge that responsibility to protect its own people, the responsibility passes to the international community, which must take all kinds of appropriate measures and ultimately, if use of force is required, needs uh, the approval uh, of the Security Council. The proponents of the doctrine, very cleverly, I think, in retrospect, emphasized in the early years 
the state responsibility and they downplayed the uh, international responsibility and particularly downplayed the use of force. And I think it, it, they did so to generate more consensus and I think the fact that it was embraced by the General Assembly was very much the product of that strategy. The problem with that is we wasted a lot of time stating the obvious, which is that states have a responsibility to protect their own people. We didn't spend a lot of time on the hard edge of the international military intervention. So when Libya occurred, the, the framework for thinking it through, you know, when is it appropriate to intervene and so on, had not, I think, received a huge amount of attention. So there was a rush, the rush to save the people of Benghazi. I mean, again, if you remember, they were approximately 300 people killed in Libya when the Security Council authorized military force. We're now at 100,000 in Syria and nothing's happening. Um, and I think there's been um, a lot said about that. Uh, so now all the conversation is about military intervention. When is it appropriate? Uh, does it require the Security Council, which I, I don't think this will be forthcoming in the case of, of Syria. And where does that leave the doctrine? First, I, I think it's very clear that this is essentially a humanitarian doctrine. It's not a conflict resolution doctrine. The, the second thing um, that, that I think should be made clear is that in the case of, uh, of Libya, I don't know exactly how to put it, but as one of my former judge colleagues used to say, this is one of these cases where the moral high ground is largely unoccupied. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> he was right. In the case of Libya, those who were pushing for uh, getting the Security Council approval for the intervention in Libya, very conveniently uh, obscured the reality which in my opinion, is pretty obvious and was obvious in that case, which is that if you will try to save a population from a leader who has murderous intentions against his own people, the only way you're going to do that is by regime change. But this was never made explicit. In fact, there was constant denial. No, this is not about regime change. It's about protecting the people of Benghazi. The minute the Security Council resolution was enacted, it all became about regime, regime change. So it was obtained, in a sense, if not by deception, I would say by not the kind of candor that in democratic societies you would expect of your governments when they're asking you an authorization to go to war. And the NATO operations in Libya were an act of war. We could call it whatever we want, that's what it was. On the other side, I'm not absolutely, totally persuaded of the sincerity of those who claim that they were deceived. Again, it was to me perfectly apparent that if you were seriously going to protect Libyans from their murderous leaders, he would have to go. And for those who say that they were deceived, um, the Russians in particular, who have claimed that subsequently, uh, I'm a little skeptical about their sincerity, but frankly, in a diplomatic environment, they don't have to be sincere, they just have to be plausible. And they are plausible that this resolution was obtained without full disclosure. So in a sense, I think Libya was a military success and a diplomatic fa failure, and the price is being paid, I think, in the paralysis of the council um, on Syria. The, the non-intervention in Syria is not exclusively due um, to the fallout from the, the Libya case, but certainly didn't help the polarization in the Security Council. But what I want to stress is there is a case that is never mentioned when we talk about R2P, which to me has been his great, its greatest failure uh, as, a, as an operational doctrine to date. It was endorsed by the General Assembly in 2005. In 2009, January to May 2009, 30 to 40,000 people were slaughtered on the beaches of Sri Lanka. The Security Council was not even seized of the issue. Absolutely nothing was done to protect these civilians, even though they were images of 300,000 people stuck on a beach being shelled by the, uh, uh, the armed forces of, of uh, Sri Lanka. This is never mentioned in a responsibility to protect environment, which I think is not to, the, to our collective credit. 
so just to kind of um, supplement a lot of what Louisa has said, everything, I, I, every, everything of which I agree with, um, you know, the, the issue with, one of the big issues with RDP is inconsistency, right? So Louise has kind of highlighted the gap between the lack of response in Sri Lanka to, to a case that obviously triggered the RTP doctrine. I mean, the grounds for triggering it are very narrow, as you know, right? They, they were narrowed between the release of the commission and the codification of it, as it were, by the General Assembly and also the Secretary General to very, very serious situations, crimes against humanity, genocide, et cetera, and so forth. Um, not obviously present in Libya at that moment, um, manifestly so uh, in Sri Lanka, and, and, the, and, and manifestly so in Syria, right? And so when you have a situation where a doctrine is not applied to cases where, uh, is not applied to, to mo mobilize the international community in cases that are paradigmatic instances that should trigger it, but is where, it is applied to a case where it wasn't clear at the time that the doctrine ought to be triggered, then it, it immediately um, robs it of credibility. That's sort of number one. And so I think we're kind of, it's a, you know, what happens to RTP now is not clear. And the longer Syria goes on, the, you know, the, the fate of RTP becomes more clouded. Number two, um, Syria drew, the Libya debate uh, the, the, drew RTP into the Security Council. And so that is, has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage, of course, is that the Security Council is where for better or for worse, major issues of collective security are often worked out. The disadvantage is that it's subject to paralysis and vetoes. And, as a court, and of course, the, the interests of China and Russia are very different in Syria than they were in Libya. Uh, and in Libya, of course, you had the OIU, the OIC, the GCC, the, 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 you know, the Arab League all lined up in favor of the Libya intervention. That's not the case uh, in Syria where, you know, and, and for the Arab League in particular, uh, you know, Syria has divided the Arab League along Sunni Shia lines, where Iraq is a big back, backer of the regime, sub silentio. Uh, and so, so, you're, you're, so it's kind of, you're subject to the Security Council and its pathologies. The other thing, you know, is that if you read Resolution 1973 that authorized the, the use of force in, in Libya, what's interesting is that it focused on prong one, not prong three of RTP. So it said that the Libyan government has failed to meet its obligation to protect its population. Therefore, um, it, the, you know, it is authorized uh, to use military intervention. It did not invoke prong three, which is the obligation of the international community, the duty to intervene. And so it's arguably the, the Libya resolution sort of has been misread as, as in a sense triggering the responsibility to protect on the part of the international communities. It, it might be better read as, as giving them permission. And so we might be back to the, the old French doctrine Right of a power to intervene, right? Not a responsibility to protect. So the so the so 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 the, and so maybe and maybe one last point, which I, is that I think that the Libya um, episode has framed um, how publics think about R2P in terms of um, coercive intervention on part of the international community. But that's not what the third prong says, right? The third prong includes coercive intervention, but it also, but the, but the ultimate goal is to end the harm to civilians, right? So in the Syrian case, it might be that RTP is discharged by promoting a political settlement. That might have, an, that there might be military inducements to reach it, but it isn't necessarily war, it doesn't demand um, that the military force be used in every case. It, it permits it. It requires it if there's no other means available. It's a last resort, right? So. Can I just add, just. Sure, and if people, have, we're gonna take questions in a minute, so Yeah, just a couple of that. footnotes to what uh, Sujit just said. Uh, first, first of all, I think, yes, it, it, it's been uh, noted that the Security Council in Resolution 1973 certainly did not explicitly accept and recognize its own duty or responsibility to intervene. One would hope that it's because they got very good legal advice uh, that I'm never too sure, but one would hope that because, in fact, and I've posed that question before, when we talk about responsibility to protect, what kind of responsibility are we talking about? Moral, political, or legal? If it's a legal responsibility, and if we say the international community, comma, acting through the Security Council if use of force is required, has a responsibility to protect people. Well then, failure to discharge that responsibility 
would have legal consequences, as the International Court of Justice has found uh, in the case of the responsibility to prevent genocide under the Genocide Convention in the case of Bosnia against Serbia. Now, if I were the legal advisor, particularly to the veto holders in the Security Council, I would be very wary of accepting using language that might suggest that there's any kind of legal uh, responsibility, because then the failure to, that's the big difference between le droit d'ingérence, the right to intervene, which is purely discretionary on the part of the right holder, and the duty to intervene, in which case, uh, omission to act could carry legal consequences, including the award of damages. And so they, they might have been um, a real sense, not just a political uh, reluctance to accept that, that international responsibility, but a smart uh, legal um, decision to stay away from it. And the, just a second observation on what you said. It's true that in the case of Syria, of Libya, sorry, the Arab League was very instrumental, and Qatar in particular, in persuading, I think, some in the Security Council who might have been reluctant to embrace. You know, we're in, in an era of celebrating regionalism, uh, empowering uh, regional organizations. Well, in that one, they were, it was a competing one, which had a completely different agenda, the African Union. And the political fallout, I think, is, is still felt today. The African Union, um, I think Jacob Zuma was leading a mission trying to go into Tripoli to continue to negotiate. You had two regional organizations. Libya, I think, in the geopolitical world, I mean, is viewed, depending on your perspective, either as a Middle East and North Africa uh, country or as an African country. It's a huge player, was under Gaddafi, huge player in African politics. And then you had two regional bodies completely at odds. And uh, particularly, I think, the Western countries uh, made a choice. They chose the one with which they agreed, which was the Arab League, rather than the African Union initiative in that case. So um, I'd like to invite people to uh, bring any questions they'd like at this point. Um, if no one's here right now, I'll maybe take one question <laughs> right away. Oh, sorry. Please go up to the podium if you'd like to ask a question. Yep, whoever's, whoever would like to. Yeah. I'm sorry, please state your name and where you're coming from. Sure. My name is Amin Meleka. I'm Consul General of Egypt in Montreal. I just want to bring a question about uh, Can the role of Canada in the world. And, um, okay, coming from Egypt, of course, uh, Canada has been always very highly regarded because, as you know, in the Swiss crisis of 56, it was Canada's very own uh, Lester Pearson who kind of say invented the concept of uh, les casques bleus or the blue helmets and managed to keep the peace in, in the Sinai thanks to, thanks to this brilliant uh, idea and this dedication uh, to, to peace in, uh, in faraway lands as in, as in Egypt, I mean, considered the, the distance between Egypt and uh, Canada. Uh, it seemed that uh, in, the, in the last decade or something that uh, Canada's role or its image see, uh, in the world or its involvement seems to have been taking a different course. And some were saying that um, this was the conclu uh, its conclusion was almost like the international community kind of rebuffing uh, its bid to uh, a non-permanent uh, seat on the Security Council in 2010. Now, what would you say about this? I'm really asking the question to understand. I'm not trying to make any comments here, because as I said, uh, coming from Egypt, this is a country that we very highly regard in, in its uh, in its um, you know, involvement in, in the world and in, in peacekeeping, peacekeeping and other. Thank you. Okay, so hmm, that's a very complicated question. So, so I guess, th so, the, so the question is, how is Canada perceived now internationally? I think that's the question. And the, and the exhibit, the evidence that's used as to suggesting the impression isn't necessarily positive is what happened in 2010 when we lost to Portugal, right, for a Security Council seat that we would have never lost before. So, and that was very embarrassing and bruising for us. So, so, so what I would say is that I think that in certain multilateral institutions, and not, ne not nearly all of them, I think Canada has not nearly been as active and energetic um, an agenda setter as it once was. I think there has been uh, disengagement 
and I think, it, it, and, and in some cases, kind of opposition to, or disharmony with a kind of emerging multilateral consensus in certain areas. And I, I thinking principally of the kind of in the in the UN system, particularly located in and around the Secretariat, uh, and I think that that's had consequences. Um, I think it it means that Canada. I think the Security Council seat was lost for a lot of reasons. Uh, I think that was one of them. Uh, there were others had to do, having to do with CETA. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a much bigger story. I also think that Canada is being excluded from certain multilateral discussions um, that are organized around the committees of the UN. And I think that this has nothing to do with the remarkable people at DFATE who, uh, you know, who I interact with frequently when I travel internationally. I mean, I always meet with our ambassadors in Libya and Egypt and, I mean, wherever I go, I'm usually, I usually see the folks from DFATE. It's, 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 it's a lack of resources and also a lack, if I may say it, of vision. You know, I think that, this idea of a small to mid-sized country and, a, and a, the only, you know, the, the, the principal platform for a country like Canada to assert its influence is through multilateralism. And there is such an amazing role that a country like Canada can play by being bright, articulate, and innovative in these multilateral settings. And it's a pity that Lloyd Axworthy is not here because, of course, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, he epitomized what uh, that way for Canada to be engaged, but he was not the only one. You know, he just he was carrying on a tradition, and that's not our role right now in those institutions. On the other hand, you know, I'm proud of the fact that Canada has taken a strong line in Sri Lanka. I'm proud of the fact that Canada did not attend a head of state's meeting there, and I think the role. I, I think, and I'm proud of the fact that Canada has highlighted that the impeachment of the Chief Justice of Sri Lanka contravened. Sri Lankan constitutional law and international standards on the independence of the judiciary. So that Canada deserves credit for that. So, so it's, a, it's a complicated story. Uh, and I and you imagine there'd be a different story in the international financial institutions, a different story in trade, right? So it, it's, it's not a uniform story, but I think what you're highlighting has to do with one element of it uh, within the, sec the UN and in particular New York. Yeah, well, I, I think it's... Uh to the extent that one can notice an absence, I mean, I think it characterizes, we could characterize the situation now as Canada being very absent. I think it, uh, uh, just two small remarks. Like you, I happen to agree with the position that Canada took on Sri Lanka in not attending uh, the Commonwealth uh, Head of State Summit. The problem though, as you've just very uh, clearly pointed out, is that when you are not a player, a regular player, mm -hmm. and a builder of alliances, mm -hmm. when you take a strong position, you're very isolated. Absolutely. Now, in the end, the Prime Minister of India didn't go. There was a little bit of momentum. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to rally anybody to your cause when you feel strongly about one cause if you're never there when they're looking for support for their own causes. So you have to play. I agree. You cannot just play on the few issues that interest you. Uh, and as you pointed out, for a country like Canada, it's virtually impossible uh, to have much impact if you play alone. Um, and think about you know Mulroney in South Africa, right? You know that, that, and Clark, you know Joe Clark. You know, I mean, that was a great moment for us. We were able to stand up to the UK, but we had allies right, in the Commonwealth yeah. when we did that. Whereas I think on Sri Lanka, we're largely isolated. Yeah. And yeah. and I have to say, I think Canada certainly having uh, looked at worked inside the UN and look at the enormous significance of regional groups. It, in the UN, everything is played, you know, the number of seats on the Human Rights Council or, or everything is decided by regional groups. Canada is really squeezed because the Western group, which is essentially Europe, North America, and Australia and New Zealand, Canada is very much the kind of oddball there, squeezed between Europe and America, and Australia, which is smaller, but has the advantage that it's, it's a very big player in the Pacific. Mm. So Canada, I mean, its own backyard is Latin America. Well, the US is not exactly absent. Um, Australia, on the other hand, when it turns to Indonesia and to Southeast Asia, is a very important player. So in a sense, Canada, would, in my view, would have to work even that much harder mm to occupy a space that it now appears to have deliberately decided not even to bother to occupy at all. 
So it's a, a, a challenge. My own view is that First of all, I think for electoral politics, it would appear for the most part that foreign affairs issues don't matter enormously, and that's true not just in Canada, it's true everywhere. But the flip side of that is, when I look at a country like Norway, for instance, which punches way above its weight in international affairs, it seems to me that the characteristic is that, even though I know nothing about Norwegian internal politics, it's as though there had been a deliberate investment in kind of bipartisan um, foreign affairs policy. Norway has a mediator role that it has had for decades, that it still played, found a niche, occupy that niche. There's nobody as good as the Norwegians in these processes. They're now the facilitators of the peace talks in Havana between uh, the FARC and the, the government of Colombia. They, they've been everywhere. So it doesn't have to be that, but it seems to me that if somebody could convene a kind of genuinely bipartisan um, uh, design of foreign policy, identify a few issues where all parties could agree, because you see, short-termism is, uh, is the curse of democracies. <laughs> and for, to, to regain the ground and make your mark in a, a, this, this complex, multipolar world. You can't do it on a four-year, five-year electoral cycle. You'd have to have a, a foreign policy vision, a couple of pillars that everybody agrees to, and go for it, invest the next 15, 20 years, whether it's in institutional reform in the, in the UN, whatever, environment. I understand that you know, we have elections to give guidance to our governments, but surely we could find um, something in which Canada as a country, all parties uh, uh, coming together could agree and focus. Short of that, I, don't, I can't see how long it's gonna, it's gonna take to regain the kind of prominence that was characterized by the only Nobel Peace Prize Canada ever got, which is, you know, we got a lot of mileage out of it, but it's just well, about well, getting a little yeah. tired. Thank, thank you, Luis. Um, I just want to make sure we get to some other questions before we move on to the next set of questions. And we will save time at the end for a broader discussion about directions in Canadian foreign sure. policy, and right. at which we can, we can expand a bit further. Um, just a, just a, in terms of guidelines, we have uh, many more brilliant people here in the room than we have time to listen to sometimes. So please keep your questions really succinct um, and directed at some of the discussion we had uh, previously. Okay. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. Uh, Gerard Barebe, uh, 2013 Trouble Scholar. Um, my question is about, you mentioned Libya and uh, the NATO intervention, and, and we all, for example, saw what happened and how the almost uh, a big, a significant number of Libyan infrastructure was destroyed by NATO. And you talk about the responsibility to protect, but you have not talked about the responsibility while protecting. And so I, I was wondering how that the two, um, how do we reconcile the two of this? And then, um, you, you also mentioned about uh, civilian being killed in uh, Sri Lanka, and we know that there are really a lot of countries in Congo, in Central African Republic, in, in Sudan, where civilians are being killed. So we are talking about the responsibility to protect, and we are protecting, for example, in Libya, if you did protect, and in Syria and in either other places, there is no protection going on. How do we determine the threshold at which the responsibility to protect shifts from being a state responsibility to international uh, community responsibility, if you can make those two very clear. Thanks. Um, well, I, I think if we go back to the, the original document, I mean, what we have in the UN doctrine is very succinct. It's just a couple of lines. If we go back, there's a lot of guidance, I think, in the report of the, the, the commission uh, that uh, military uh, resort to, to the use of force, military intervention, you know, should be a last resort. There's a kind of proportionality proposal that um, the balance of convenience and it's something very familiar, I think, in certainly in Canadian legal yeah. circles. So there is a framework, I think, to make that decision. The bottom line is it's always going to be a political call. You can have all this uh, doctrinal framework of all the steps you have to take. Um, in the end, you will either uh, have a Security Council resolution or you won't, and this will have very little to do, I think, with all this kind of analytical framework. That's the first thing. The second thing I, uh, that I just, because uh, it's crossing my mind as you ask that question, uh, in uh, the DRC, for instance, as you know, the uh, 
UN peacekeeping missions, which are now much more peace making than peace keeping, um, uh, they've now had a recent success with these uh, intervention brigades. Much, much more robust form of, of peacekeeping, which all based on the protection of civilian part of their mandate. The danger with that is that now we're, we're seeing an increased appetite for peacemaking by warfare, an increased call in appetite for the use of force. And to me, so this in and of itself, I think, increases the risk uh, to civilians. It has the risk also of pushing back even further the need for the more difficult tasks of political engagement, institution buildings, the other things that you need to reconstruct a country. And finally, it seems to me much the more dangerous aspect of that is that the UN, under this protection of civilian R2P, whatever we call it, risk becoming the strong arm of weak governments, which is bad, particularly bad if these governments are weak, not just because of lack of capacity, but because of lack of legitimacy. Uh, so it's not just a kind of abstract lack of impartiality or neutrality. It's becoming the enforcer of those who, in name only, deserve to be selected um, as, as the side we're going to take. So, so I think there's still a lot that needs to be um, uh, looked at there. OK. Thank you very much. And maybe we'll just take one last question uh, hey. from microphone number one. One last question? Yes, unfortunately, we have, we have a more discussion after this yeah. and then more discussion, so. OK, there'll be, there'll be more questions later. You'll have an opportunity to discuss. Please. Uh, Kyle Matthews from the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. Um, we've talked about Canada's uh, kind of retreat from multilateralism in the United Nations. Um, but at the same time, here domestically, we've had quite a few important international organizations that have actually bit the dust. Uh, the Pearson Peacekeeping Center has been defunded. Uh, the uh, International Center for Rights and Democracy has closed down. So my question to the panel members, uh, can Canada really play a, a, a larger role in global affairs without the institutions here in Canada to bring about innovative ideas and to shape government policy? Thank you. So that, that gets to what we want to talk about, I think. Yeah, I think okay. later on we're going to talk, we're going to have a broader discussion about Canada and the world. So if we want to focus on questions that are yeah, I that mean, are should, focused on RTP or the, the Arab Spring at this point. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I want to pick up on that at some point. Of so course. you tell me when, because I think it's a critical issue. Okay. So whenever you, whenever you think is appropriate. Okay. Well, maybe we'll save it for we'll have a, a broader yeah. discussion about. Yeah. It. I don't want to I don't want to stifle the conversation on this. It's obviously a lot to say and a no, lot of enthusiasm. But that's a huge issue. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well maybe we'll just, we'll move to, uh, to another big issue that we want to address. And of course, you know, two people with very strong legal backgrounds will have a lot of insight on this. It's about the future of the International, uh, International Criminal Court. Um, basically after 10 years of operations, what factors are kind of hindering the proper functioning of the court? What works, what can we do better? Um, we'd be grateful for some insight on that. Suja, do you want to start? All right. Or Louise? You want to? I, I know you spoke recently about this, so why don't you? Well, there's, what, a, there, yeah, there's, yeah, a, lot, so. there's a lot to say. Yeah. The first thing, uh, I think it's fair to say that the International Criminal Court currently is under an enormous amount of stress. Um, I was uh, just last night uh, at a retreat of the Security Council members. They had just come back from last week voting on the request uh, by Kenya for a deferral of the case, and it was very emotional, actually. The, the members of the council was still a very raw issue. Um, Anyway, it's, the, the court is in this, I think, very difficult position for a number of reasons. The main one is that I think despite all the rhetoric, you know, there's no lasting peace without justice and so on, we just haven't worked out how these two perfectly legitimate aspirations to peace and to justice actually work together. We just have not quite worked it out. Um, I, I referred to the Columbia uh, peace process, we published in Crisis Group a report about two months ago on transitional justice in Colombia. It's very challenging. You have the FARC ready to come out of the jungle after 50 years of conflict, and their original opening position in the negotiation was no one goes to jail. Well, 50 years ago that might have been an option. It's just not an option today. And they seem very surprised that a sovereign government, like the government of Colombia, could not just grant a blanket amnesty. Well, actually, it can't. 
its own constitutional court would strike it down. The Organization of American States uh, uh, Human Rights Court would strike it down. The United Nations, nobody would cooperate in enforcing a peace agreement that would have a total amnesty for international crimes. It's not an option. On the other hand, they're the, I don't want to be flippant, but sometimes I call them the justice jihadist, who have a, a justice agenda that is completely unrealistic. It's just not gonna happen. It has never happened anywhere. The, tri the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which has been in business for 20 years, at a considerable expense, I don't want to exaggerate it, compared to peacekeeping mission, it's not a lot of money, but by any other standard, it's a lot of money. Enormous efforts, staff of over a thousand now for 20 years. When it shuts down, and it had primacy over national courts, so it was the main institution, it will have closed, what, 100 cases? Tribunal for Rwanda will probably close down with having completed about 40 cases. What are we talking about? Are we gonna tell the Colombians that they have to have a peace agreement in which there'll be an undertaking that every single uh, person, both on the side of the FARC, the paramilitaries and state agents, every single one of them is gonna be prosecuted uh, and if convicted will serve a jail term? It's never happened anywhere. So the, the tensions, I think, there in these negotiations have not been worked out. What's happened, I think, in the, the, I have another beef there. At the outset of the Rome Treaty, there are two features that were the subject of considerable debate. One was referral of cases by the Security Council. As you know, the Rome Treaty that creates the court is, is a treaty base. There now has, what, 112 uh, states, parties to the treaty, they've accepted the jurisdiction of the courts. Many countries have not accepted it. The United States, China, India, and a whole uh, range of other countries are not parties to the Rome Treaty, and therefore they're not subject to its jurisdiction, unless the Security Council refers the case to the ICC. It has done so twice. The first time, actually, I appeared as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, before the Security Council, urging them to refer Darfur to the ICC. In retrospect, at the time, I, well, first of all, it was my job, it was my brief, and I really believed that this was the right thing to do. Now, I'm not so sure. The Council has referred two cases, Darfur and Libya. After making the referral, it has given the court no additional money, no additional political support, nothing. All it has done, I think, is expose the, the weakness of the court rather than strengthen it. The only argument in favor of these Security Council referrals is that it expands the reach of accountability to countries that otherwise would not be subject um, to the scrutiny of the court. But it does so, I think, at not only this practical cost to the court, but also at a profoundly uh, um, philosophical, objectionable level the Libya reference for, and the Darfur one, but just take this recent one. The Security Council referred uh, the case of Libya, the situation in Libya, to the International Criminal Court. And in that resolution, it specifically exempted from the jurisdiction of the court nationals of non-state parties to the Rome Treaty, comma, except Libyans. Well. The rule of law is supposed to be based on the principle of equality before the law. What does that do to the very concept of justice? It meant that when NATO started striking, NATO countries started dropping bombs on Libya, if they were war crimes, crimes against humanity perpetrated, um, the nationals of NATO countries, non-parties to the Rome Statute, i.e. the United States, could not have been made answerable. So we have, I think, in these uh, referrals, a, a, a very fundamental, both philosophical and practical problem. And then Kenya. Kenya, in a sense, is the perfect case. Kenya is a member uh, of the Rome Treaty. Kenya was given every opportunity to set up its own mechanism under the complementarity rule to deal with the cases of the violence around the elections in 2007. I think there were two efforts to get something through the Kenyan parliament, it failed. So in a sense, the ICC played its role perfectly. It's a country in which it has jurisdiction. 
it tried to convince the national authorities to do it themselves. They did nothing. So as a last resort, as it's supposed to, it brings these charges. Kenyatta and Ruto ran for office while indicted. When the government of Kenya is, not ta is now talking about immunity of office holders, what are they talking about? These cr crimes were perpetrated before they were in office, and they were actually indicted before they were in office. It seems to me there's no possible rationale um, for advancing that case, and yet they won the, their elections uh, by, I think, being extremely confrontational vis-a-vis -vis the court, even though they claimed that they would cooperate with the court if elected. And now the new narrative is that Kenyans have made a choice. They've chosen political reconciliation. Of course, Kenyatta and Ruto represent two opposing political parties that have now united their forces. So now the narrative is Kenyans have repudiated justice and accountability in favor of national reconciliation. That's the first thing, and therefore we should yield uh, to that choice. And the second thing, of course, is after the attack by the Shabab uh, on, the, on Kenya, uh, we cannot, uh, this country is too fragile and it needs its leaders. And, and there's been a massive mobilization of African leaders uh, pushing back against uh, the jurisdiction of the court. So we, we now see an enterprise, I think, that, that is uh, um, the court itself that is under siege to some extent, and the very concept of the tensions be between peace and justice not fully fleshed out and accommodated. Yeah, so just to add a couple of points. So, I mean, I think there's sort of four issues. The first is that a court needs to build, build its credibility. It builds its credibility by actually successfully trying cases. And, and that requires that people be brought to them. And, and sort of having charges in the air with no prospect of enforcement, it, all it does is to undermine the credibility of international criminal justice. And Darfur is kind of exhibit A. Libya might turn out to be that. I mean, who knows? So that's a huge problem. It's very unlike, let's say, the, the Yugoslavia tribunal where over time they built up a track record. Number two, though, is the, ex is the cost benefit, the expense. These things are enormously expensive to run. And so if you kind of actually were to cost it out uh, in the most rudimentary type of analysis that how many convictions are we getting for every dollar that's spent, it's actually, it's, it's, you know, it's unbelievably cost ineffective as opposed to alternative strategies of institutionalizing criminal accountability for crimes against humanity. So blended tribunals has, have been tried elsewhere. Not always you know, easy to do, but certainly you know, it's, 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 there's a lot of kind of concerns about cost effectiveness. I think thirdly, the selectivity with respect to Africa. I mean, this has been, this is widely discussed. It's a, the, the court's docket's dominated by cases from Africa. Now it turns out many of those cases were brought by African countries themselves. Uh, but in a couple of cases, it was cases. Uh, there were cases where the prosecutor uh, launched cases, and and there uh, there is an absence of cases, for example, from the Middle East, you know, or from from other parts of the world. And so the you know, the the court looks like an African court. And so the part of the you know, I think that sense combined with the dynamic in Kenya is really what was on you know, what what drove this debate in Addis uh, a few weeks ago, which in a sense, you know calm down, uh, but who knows where this is going to go. But, the, but the, I think the, the kind of come back to Louise's first point, as I said, constitutions are alternatives to civil war, right? In many real life contexts, to get to a constitution, you have to get out of a civil war. Your political opponents are your, are your armed opponents. And if you want them to put down their arms and become political parties, and draft a constitution with you and work with it under its rules, they have to have some incentive to do so. And so I, I agree that the international environment's changed, that blanket amnesties are, you know, have been found to be in contravention of international you know, human rights treaties. The American Commission has said so and so forth. But the practical political reality is that without some type of amnesty, you can't lubricate talks. In Dakar, before the negotiations between the Nats and the ANC, the first demand that the National Party made was to be immune from war crimes prosecutions. If you want to talk, that is the first, you have to give us that guarantee. Saleh in Yemen, to kind of come to a more recent example, again, his, I wouldn't say exit, because he's still a powerful person in Yemeni politics, but his decision to kind of step aside from the presidency was lubricated by some guarantees of immunity. 
you need to do, you need to have that. These tools are tools of the mediator, and they're often necessary as a price in some cases for for peace. Now I know Louise is going to going to react to that, but I think I think understanding these trade-offs and what is at stake here is important. Yeah. Can I react to this? Yeah, yeah, sure <laughs> I have to. Okay. You can feel my blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, see, I think that's exactly where we are making a mistake in saying that these are tools of mediators. Uh, I think that the the question of pro put, putting criminal justice in the hands of political mediators is a very big mistake. Uh, if we were to completely redesign, but even try to, to recalibrate where we are, I would argue that you have to try to segregate the justice track and the political track as much as possible rather than merge it. Um, when, I, when I was in the UN system, the flavor of the day on these issues was sequencing, you know, one after the other. Well, guess which one always came first? Peace and justice, well, and the example was, oh, look at the Latin Americans, it took them 30, 50 years to get there. Well, that was then and this is now. We now have a much more ambitious, I think, accountability agenda. Um, there are lots of very bad peace deals that have been made with very bad guys, and these peace deals yielded um, no peace at all in a lot of cases, resumption of hostilities, cycles of revenge. Um, so I don't think it's a very good idea. But more importantly, I mean, one peace negotiation that went nowhere exactly because it was trying to do that is the negotiations with the LRA and with the Ugandans. The mediator is sitting there with four um, uh, indicted war criminals, Joseph Kony and three others at that time, maybe five. What does he have to deliver? He doesn't control the indictments. He can't say to them, oh, if you sign here and you, you surrender and you demobilize, we're going to lift the, the, uh, the indictments. He has nothing to deliver. That's the first point. It's either the court or the Security Council uh, that can deliver that. Secondly, you're negotiating with people who are in an absolute conflict of interest. They're indicted. Their personal interest is to get rid of the indictment. But in terms of their people, there's no interest there in whether these people will be, in fact, if there is an interest, it's probably in that they should be prosecuted. So it seems to me that the only way you can advance that is to segregate the two and to say, well, you're indicted, that's the judicial track and there's nothing I could do about it. I can't see how else you can make it happen. To say it's a tool, the reality is it cannot be a tool. The mediator doesn't control the judicial process. So it's a false kind of fraudulent tool and if you start playing with it, uh, then it becomes evident that you can't deliver and Coney walked right back into the jungle and the whole thing collapsed uh, because I think it was a very misguided uh, enterprise from the beginning. Thank you very much. I don't want to give Louise the last word, but I do want to move on to other questions, and I'm sure we'll be able to continue these discussions throughout the evening and uh, tomorrow as well. But I want to go back to Canada's role in the world, and I want basically to go back to the question that our colleague had asked about, you know, broadly speaking, I mean, what is Canada's value added? Where are we going? You know, what are opportunities that we're not taking or some that we actually have? And then also to go back to the question of what does the closure of the, the Pearson Peacekeeping Center, Rights and Democracy mean for our role in the world? So, so just, you know, so um, unlike the la with respect to the last comment, I think Louise and I are going to be in violent agreement now. So, um, so uh, you know, Canada needs a brand, okay? So the Norwegians have made mediation their brand, right? You know, when I, when I, I mean, I've been working a lot in the Middle East um, for the last two years, and I keep on running to the Dutch and the Germans and the Swedes, and, you know, and they're so energetic and they're so active and they're so there and it breaks my heart because we're not because it would be very very easy for Canada to have a brand in the realm of democracy promotion and good governance you know constitutions is obviously an element of that um, managing pluralism obviously something that we have a lot of experience with um, although again you, you can't globalize the Canadian experience, right? And I think there's a huge mistake at saying, well, but we've done it this way, therefore you should do it that way. It's a horrible way to, to give support in democracy promotion work, and Canadians are really guilty of that a lot of the time. 
uh, and you can't, you, you know, these countries are very different, but we have a lot of experience and know-how and understanding of how to manage pluralism, uh, and I think that would be a, kind of a brand. Um, work on corruption and the rule of law, um, d the building of strong judiciaries, uh, you know, a few areas that are of kind of, that are of, that are not partisan issues or are not items or matters of partisan cleavage where we're basically building democratic infrastructure. And, 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 the, and the, the secret, kind of the mix, what you need for this is a strategy and then um, institutions that are arm's length from government but in many cases have been set up by government through foundations that have a mandate to be active and energetic intellectually. And then, the, and then there's two other ingredients. And this, if you look at Norway, these ingredients are all there. You have a very, very energetic and active MFA, a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that basically are um, deal makers. They bring in business. Guess what? You've got this issue. We've got these fabulous outfits back in Ottawa that can help you on this. And they are the matchmakers. The, the, you know, the, the Norwegians and the Germans and the, and the Dutch do this all the time. The MFAs work as partners with these arm's length organizations and they collaborate deeply and it dramatically improves, improves everyone's effectiveness. The third element um, is um, very close ties with the university sector. So you know, in, in Oslo, you, know, you have these outfits that are, that, are, that are NGOs, but you also have really fantastic research centers at the universities working on conflict resolution, and there's a back and forth uh, between kind of applied policy research and its implementation in the field, and you're training people who go and work at these organizations, and they teach at the universities, and so there's, a, there's kind of a, a magic that happens when you have universities, and you have governments, and you have sophisticated, well-funded NGOs with real bench strength with their core funding guaranteed, you know, then you can do that. And, and we ha we've had the elements of that in the past, you know, the Forum of Federations, which is a terrific organization that I, I work with a lot. It, it, it is, you know, it, it's not nearly well funded as it used to be. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, it's a shame because that was a kind of a made in Canada idea that Bob Ray and Stefan Dion had that really is the best organization of its kind in the world. Um, and could be a leader on that. And there's others, you know, rights and democracy and so forth. But, you know, the, the point is you need a strategy. It's not just about creating those outfits or institutes in response to the other question. You need much more than that. And you need a commitment at the very highest political levels to, to do this. You know, so for example, with the form of federations in Sri Lanka, it mattered a lot that Bill Graham cared a lot about Sri Lanka for political reasons, but that's life, you know? But he also cared at a personal level, and he, and DFATE kind of, in a sense, was a door opener for the forum to be very engaged in Sri Lanka for, for a very long time. And that kind of partnership uh, is something that I think we're missing now. Thank you very much, and uh, before turning to Luis, if people have questions, they can start lining up, and we'll, uh, we'll take them afterwards. Yeah, I think, um I, I certainly agree that you need these partnerships with independent uh, think tanks or uh, foundations. It's particularly critical in countries like Canada, like many European countries, that don't have the history and the built-in wealth of American philanthropy. Mm -hmm. In America, you don't need the, the US government to set up these outfits because yeah. you have these massively endowed um, uh, phil uh, philanthropies, foundations, here, there's neat here and elsewhere, actually, throughout Europe. You have neither the tradition, you don't have the culture of kind of civil society coming together with massive, massive financial capacity. And therefore, it has to be done through public support, which, frankly, I think if you really believe in democracy, is probably a better model in any event, mm -hmm. uh, because it's not necessarily linked to the original guidance of the founder of these massive amounts of wealth and decisions that are made all with, I think, uh, good objectives, but not necessarily um, in a balanced public uh, policy way. I mean, if you look at the big American philanthropies, a lot of the money goes in sectors that, uh, that are, in a sense, very traditional. Health, education, the arts, sports, um, and now, increasingly in modern years, human rights, like Human Rights Watch and 
um, amnesty, and in our case, conflict prevention, but you, not, nowhere near on the scale of what you see in the health, education, cultural uh, type sectors. I mean, as an example, not in foreign affairs, but when the Canadian Constitution uh, came into force in 1982, there were two features that I think have not been sufficiently celebrated. One, very counterintuitive, was the moratorium on equality rights. Mm -hmm. So the hard edge of the Constitution didn't kick in for three years. It gave judges, in a sense, a time to flex their judicial muscles in areas that they were more traditionally comfortable with before they had to take on the really tough issues. I think it was a brilliant foresight. The second one was the, the setting up of the court challenge program, mm. where the government had the foresight to finance, not to, have, to let people have to rely on pro bono legal services and so on, real money to finance the judicial branch as a full partner in constitutionalism. This is really brilliant. Now, you might say whether you agree or disagree with the decision by the current government to say, well, it had, it had uh, uh, stayed its utility. I mean, most of the big challenges, that's, that's a political decision, whether there was still enough that needed to be supported. But it was a kind of initiative that was a game changer, I think, in the, the very rapid development of Canadian constitutional jurisprudence in the first 20 years of the chart. 10, 12 years of the charter. So if you use that as a parallel, it's really critical that governments, uh, as I said, because private sector philanthropy is just not available, uh, put money to, to uh, help civil society to mobilize on these issues. Great, thank you. Um, now we have about 10 minutes for uh, questions. And uh, maybe what we can do is we can just combine, we can have take two questions to start at the same time. And please, uh, once again, Keep it succinct and on. Very succinct. Shabbat shalom. My name is Clarice Harbin. I'm a 2011 Trudeau Scholar. Um, and first of all, it was amazingly, I felt like I'm in an intellectual ping pong. So thank you. Very interesting. Um, so I, I'm just reflecting on the title Canada in the World. And we've been talking in the last hour about the role of Canada in preserving and reproducing certain values and rights that Canadians cherish and think as important. But let me approach that in reverse about the role of the role of the world in Canada and how we, the world is happening every day here and the challenges that we face. Well, not me, because I'm not Canadian yet in Canada, outside, also happen here vis-a-vis -vis immigrants. For example, in Quebec now, the big debate and controversy about the values, um, about the charter of values. So I would love to hear your intake on that, on the micro yet very big macro level. Thank you. And before answering, we'll take another question from the microphone number one. Yeah, uh, I'm John McGarry, a 2011 uh, fellow. And my question is for Louise, and it's on this conflict between uh, justice and peace. Uh, in Northern Ireland in, in 1997, the IRA uh, were trying to bring along a rank and file uh, behind the peace process. And one of their crucial demands was that prisoners, IRA prisoners, and indeed all prisoners uh, connected to the political violence be released uh, uh, and the British government delivered that. They did release those uh, prisoners uh, on license, which meant that uh, if they re-offended or their organizations uh, broke their ceasefires, the prisoners would go back and they would serve time for whatever new offense and for the remainder of the time uh, for the old offense. Um, these prisoners became champions of the peace process and uh, Sinn Féin, the political party that was the wing of the IRA, uh, signed up to that peace process. A few years later, it uh, surrendered uh, all of its arsenal. Uh, and in fact, the Canadian John de Chastelain played a crucial role in that. Now, as a result of that peace process, uh, whereas before the agreement, uh, somewhere in the region of 830 uh, British soldiers were killed in Northern Ireland, which is more, by the way, than the British Army lost in the uh, Falklands War, uh, the first Gulf War, Iraq and Afghanistan combined. Um, uh, they lost 830 before 1998. They've lost one soldier since. Uh, the police force 
lost 302 officers out of a force of 5,000. Very high casualty rate. Uh, since 1998, they've, they've lost two policemen. Uh, no civilians have been killed in the last three or four years. I'm just wondering um, what, what you would have done in 1998 faced with that demand from uh, an organization, the IRA, for release of prisoners, would, how would you have responded? And what do you think the effect of that response would be? Um, well, f first, I, it, it's difficult to go back at any particular point in history because the legal options might have been different. But today, I would certainly agree that there should be amnesty, pardons, release of prisoners for what are called political crimes. Any crimes outside the range of international crimes. International crimes being genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. Essentially, large-scale deliberate targeting of civilians and so on. Now, in uh, civil wars where there's a considerable blurring, um, very deliberate, I must add, between civilians and combatants, that may be difficult, but in general terms, and I think what's being discussed in Colombia now, uh, we are certainly proposing that there should be a full amnesty for political crimes and crimes associated with political crimes, such as drug trafficking, uh, done to raise money to support the political activities, for instance, of the FARC. That should all be, um, it should all be possible to trade that off in exchange for a peace deal. Now, I think in international law, it is no longer an option to give these kinds of amnesties for, and this could include killings, you know, as long as it's not on the scale that elevates it to a crime against humanity or a war crime. So that would be my answer. I think then or today, there is no question that the peace dividends that you get from amnesties, pardons, and so on for crimes for which this is an open option is a, is a perfectly legitimate uh, and obviously has been proven, I think, very successful. I understand, though, I read a couple of days ago that there's now a decision, I think, to stop uh, for any further prosecutions of matters related to Northern. I haven't looked into a lot of details, but I think there, there's now less desire to, to continue uh, probing past offenses. Thank you. So, do you want to take a crack? Yeah, so, I'll take the other question, which was you know, about uh, Canadian multiculturalism, Canadian diversity, and how that affects Canadian foreign policy. And I would say it has a big effect uh, in this sense that you know, Canada's um, ability to lead and convene um, is in large part based on its soft power, its, its, its moral attractiveness as a certain type of political, economic, and legal model. That, that's how Canada gets moral authority uh, in certain discussions and why people listen when Canada speaks and still do. Uh, and I think that one element of that, of course, is how we treat our new Canadians and new immigrants. And so I think that there are severe foreign policy consequences from the type of debate that's happening now in Quebec. And people should not think it, people aren't looking at what's happening in Quebec internationally. It's extremely, it's, it's, it does not make Canada look good. And, and if, I can kind of, if I can pick out one element in particular, this ridiculous diagram showing permitted and impermissible religious headgear, what a PR disaster, not just within Canada, but internationally. Do you not think that people around the world in the era of social media do not look at that and wonder what Canada stands for, what this is about Canada, not a unit within Canada, not a province, not even a nation, but the state as a whole. It's extremely serious. And so how we treat ourselves and our minorities within our midst is enormously significant to the type of credibility we have when we go and champion the rights of religious minorities, for example, in Egypt, as we are doing now with Minister Baird. We have to live by our own ideals. We can't afford to not live by our own ideals, particularly as a small country, which otherwise people might not want to listen to. Thanks, Sujit. Um, maybe we can just take one last question in the in interest of time, and um, yeah, please keep it succinct. Sarah Kamal, 2007 uh, Trudeau Scholar. I'm interested in refugee flows. 
Um, I note that neighboring states of conflict-torn nations tend to disproportionately take the burden of refugee flows, which is neither peaceful nor just. I'm wondering, in terms of the responsibility to protect, whether it could be understood that interventionism then means responsibility afterwards for the flow of the refugees as a first port of call, for instance, for the aggressor nation, um, or at least financial responsibility. And more broadly, could it be possible for it to be understood legally, internationally, that aggressors in war are responsible for the cost and protection of refugees arising Thank from that war? Thank you, sir. So if we can answer these questions in the next, uh, solve that problem in the next five minutes, that'd be perfect. Uh, I think these are very legitimate concerns, but if you put them in a broader perspective, in a sense, we have better protection under the Refugee Convention, for instance, than we have for two other categories of people at risk, in, in particularly in times of conflict, but elsewhere. One is uh, IDPs, internally displaced uh, persons, which are still under the jurisdiction of a regime that in a lot of cases it was clear in Darfur, it's happening now in Syria. The ones that are hard to reach with humanitarian assistance, uh, very difficult to protect, are overwhelmingly internally displaced persons. And there's no, again, no UN agency dedicated to that. It falls between a lot of cracks because the High Commissioner for Refugees, its mandate is refugees, focusing on the obligation of the receiving countries and so on. So that's the, the and it's a, with, increasing civil wars, I think you have massive internal displacement, which is, I think, a much more severe problem. And the second one, of course, is the plight of economic migrants. Uh, and, you know, the Refugee Convention shows, in a sense, a product of the Western preference, I won't say bias, but preference for civil and political rights over economic and social rights, because we've never had an equivalent uh, treatment uh, for economic migrants, and the ones who are drowning in the Mediterranean today are certainly a mix of political and economic migrants. Um, so I think we have populations at risk that are, both in legal terms and in political terms, are not receiving um, the kind of attention that I think they need to. And, but I think the legal uh, imaginate, imaginative uh, uh, initiatives that you propose should be tried. I think this idea of visiting responsibility um, on perpetrators. It's the problem with that is the same thing as in a national criminal justice system. It's, it's, there's nothing there to be compensated with. Um, it's more symbolic than real. Okay, mais sur ce, il nous reste plus de temps, mais euh, je voulais euh, remercier nos experts pour une discussion qui fut euh, fort intéressante. Euh, et puis, on pourra continuer la discussion au cours de la soirée et demain. Merci beaucoup. Thank you.